Thank you very much for being with us today. And I have the privilege and uh, the uh, luck to have with us today uh, John McMurray. Uh, he doesn't need to be introduced. And John has got the brilliant idea to put together uh, a meeting uh, which is called Global Trialist Summit. Uh, this is meant to discuss uh, clinical trials and more so in the space of uh, uh, cardiorenal and metabolism. Uh, but I would like to start asking him a couple of questions, and certainly about his uh, keynote lecture, where Dr. Eugene Braunwald will discuss how cardiovascular trials have evolved, and uh, also Mark Pepper will elaborate on what clinical trials have taught him, right? So I'd like actually to ask you, John, what is your opinion? What are your views about the evolution of cardiovascular clinical trials, and what are the lessons you have learned personally in your job as a trialist. Uh, thanks, Fayez. Uh, thanks for doing the interview. And of course, you're one of the great uh, clinical trialists in the world as well. Um, what have I learned? So, so my early life was obviously growing up, learning about those first fantastic trials that were done in cardiovascular disease, the BHAT trial with propranolol, then the ISIS trials with aspirin and thrombolysis. And I realized that that had to be the future of the way that, that we practice medicine. It had to be based on evidence. And the only way to get evidence uh, of the type that we need was to do trials. So I sort of lived like you have through that evolution of trials. And I think we've seen good things and bad things. Uh, those very early trials, I, I actually was a participant in some of those, as an investigator in some of those very early ISIS trials, and it was a, a one-page CRF. It was verbal consent. Um, it was an all-cause mortality trial, uh, and, and you could identify that through national records or through the National Health Service here in the United Kingdom. Then trials got a lot more complicated, and with that, a lot more expensive, and um, and a lot more red tape and bureaucratic. And I think maybe we're beginning to come full circle again. We're beginning to realize that we've got to make them simpler again. But by and large, the, the evolution of trials, I think, has been, been very important. I think we've understood an awful lot. We've, we've learned a lot about the importance of the size of trials the trials are adequately powered statistically to be able to answer the question. That's that's fundamentally important for everybody involved, um, from the participants who are essentially putting their lives on the line for us, leading the trials, and of course the investors who pay the enormous amounts of money that these trials cost. So it's, it's very important that we design the trials properly, properly and that they can answer questions I think we've learned a lot about endpoints and about um, what's important to patients and, um, and also how to analyze those endpoints. And we've faced other challenges. Obviously, we, we, we know that our success has made trials, in a sense, more difficult because we have been so good at reducing event rates in some diseases that actually that means that it becomes harder to show the incremental value of new therapy. So there's, I would say, very, very many things that have happened in my lifetime in trials. And it's, it's just been an amazing era that we've lived through. And that's what we wanted to celebrate in this new meeting, because I think you would agree, Fires. I, I don't think there's been a time I can remember when so much has happened so quickly in all of these areas that I know both you and I are interested in, kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, and, and metabolic disease. And for example, we've seen in the past year, the first ever, it's just incredible to, to think this, the first ever trial in chronic kidney disease to show reduction in all-cause mortality. We're kind of spoiled in cardiovascular disease where we're used to that, but, but there's some real revolutions occurring in some of these other disease areas that we're all interested in, we all should be interested in. So it was really to put all of this together to celebrate it. And 
And as you pointed out, Bias, who else but Eugene Brownwald to, to be able to look back uh, at, the, at the modern history of, of trials. And I know that he will give a fascinating lecture. Great, thank you so much. And I would like to celebrate with you. And uh, in this meeting, we are celebrating trials in heart failure, in CKD, and also in diabetes. But let's start with heart failure. Uh, we have an established new class, which is HDLT2 inhibitors, and we have established dapagliflozin, we have established uh, ampagliflozin, but now with uh, Victoria, with Virisiguat, and Galactic, with uh, omega dimocarbyl our uh, half successes is debatable. Indeed, they really didn't improve as much as the HDLT2 inhibitors, uh, heart failure hospitalization, and CV death together. We don't know in addition, for sure, how SGLT2 inhibitors work in heart failure and the de development in heart failure were the result of serendipitous findings in diabetes trials. Now, in Galactic and Victoria, Omicatumacarbril and Virisiwat were respectively developed in a translation and science mode on purpose with the specific purpose of targeting pre-identified mechanisms. This wasn't the case with the SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure. So what consequences this might have on future heart failure trials? So very good point. So serendipity has always played a role in, in our um, development of therapy. So again, Bias, you and I will remember vividly the surprising finding in the SAVE study that Captopril seemed to reduce the risk of, my, of recurrent myocardial infarction. In fact, at first people didn't believe it. And then, of course, subsequent trials showed that to be true. So serendipity always plays a role in bench to bedside and bedside back to benches is an important completion of the cycle of discovery that we mustn't forget about. Um, but I suppose your, your question is, is more, I think, really about, about the size of benefit and the ability to, to incrementally improve outcomes in a clinically meaningful way. And again, there, I, I think what those two new trials you, you referred to, which we will have the PIs of those trials actually discussing the latest updates on them in, in our meeting, I think they raise other interesting questions by So for example, with Verisiguat, yes, I agree that molecule had a rather modest relative risk reduction uh, in the primary composite outcome, but actually it was studied in such a high risk population that that 10% relative risk reduction translated into a large absolute risk reduction. And again, it goes back to how do we think about the benefits of therapy? How do we quantify them? How do we explain them and describe them to both doctors and patients? Because perhaps that 10% relative risk reduction is important in some ways. The OMA captive story, I think, is the most interesting one because you're absolutely right there. There is a drug that was purposely engineered to address really the underlying problem in, in heart failure. And I think when you uh, attend the meeting fires, you will learn that there are some very interesting subgroup findings in that trial. I think we will probably conclude at the end of the day that there is a place for that molecule in the patients where you could anticipate it. It would be most appropriately targeted. And maybe that goes back to some of the things we've talked about before in terms of precision medicine. Um, and, and actually, I think there may also be, to be quite frank, um, a lesson, uh, a mistake that we made and that we should learn. And I think in every trial, you do learn from your mistakes. And, and what I'm really alluding to here is that I, the, the subgroup analysis that you've already seen by us is that this drug seems to be much more effective in patients with a very low ejection fraction. No great surprise. But when you think about it, how did we enroll patients in this trial? We relied on investigator reported ejection fraction. And these could have been, I think, up to a year old. So they did not have to be a contemporary measurement at the time of randomization. And, and they were not verified in a core laboratory. 
and maybe that means I don't know, but it's it's I think more than likely that perhaps there are many patients enrolled in the trial who, yes, 12 months ago had an injection fraction of 30%, but with the other great treatments we've got, they may have improved. And as a consequence, when they were actually enrolled in the trial, it could have been that they didn't have sufficient systolic dysfunction to actually get a meaningful benefit from this drug. But there's more to it than that. And, and I think you'll learn uh, this in, in, in the summit. So I think with every trial, even if initially it seems disappointing or what some people would call a failure, it's never that. There's always a huge amount to be learned about the disease, about how to conduct trials, and also about the therapy that you've, you've studied. Well, that's really great. And certainly learning from clinical trials, all these uh, details about analysis and sub-analysis, uh, because everybody is wondering about implementation of the results of these trials. And the best way is really to learn how to dissect the results of these trials. And uh, everybody is looking forward to hear uh, from trialists. Now, another area is chronic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And for multiple reasons, patients with chronic kidney disease are excluded from trials, whether it is uh, in heart failure, in cardiovascular, or even in renal uh, uh, diseases. So finally, we have got good quality trials in chronic kidney disease with new evidence-based kidney protective drugs, certainly the IGLT2 inhibitors, and also recently the non-steroidal uh, MRA, phenylalanine. So with this encouraged to design and run many more trials in CKD, why here have been so little evidence-based medicine nephrology so far? I don't know, Faiz. I mean, I know you have been sort of one of the, the leaders in, in pushing for uh, trials in CKD and for us always to include patients with CKD in trials. But the renal communities perhaps not been as, as interested in, in large-scale clinical trials. I mean, I think you and I probably know from our interactions with colleagues in nephrology and in metabolic medicine, there is a different way of thinking about medicine and treatment and the, the relative importance that people give to large scale clinical trials. It's also the case that, um, that perhaps patients with, with more advanced chronic kidney disease, it isn't quite as large a population globally there isn't the same infrastructure and network for doing clinical trials and chronic kidney disease, although that's changed a lot in recent years. And then there've been many disappointments and I think honestly, a sense of, of discouragement, but now that's changed overnight. And as you've pointed out, I mean, no treatments since RAS blockers and suddenly two treatments in, in literally the past 12 months. So I think things have changed changed a lot and, and I think it's it's probably um, real medicine might now be entering that era that you and I were in maybe 40 years ago at the beginning of the huge revolution in, in cardiology and the blossoming of the whole clinical trial movement in cardiology I'm hoping that we will see that in nephrology. There's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't happen. It should be no different. It's not different than cancer. It's not different than chronic lung disease, which is another area where suddenly we're starting to see this thinking. And of course, in, in metabolic disease. And, and it's, it's so interesting that in, in, the, in the diabetes world, the impetus didn't really come from the diabetes community it came from the regulators. It was that amazing 2008 FDA requirement to demonstrate cardiovascular safety. And again, that transforms our understanding of the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And as you said, serendipitously led us to discover the first life-saving treatment in CKD and this wonderful new class of drugs for heart failure, as you pointed out. So Life is so interesting and there's so many different ways in which the world changes different influences. Uh, but the important point is that we're making progress in all of these areas and we will be discussing all of this in, in, our, in our summit. 
Well, well, that's great. You are making really great points. And indeed, in nephrology, uh, there is a matter of infrastructure and also culture, by the way, because I've been uh, involved in some of these trials and certainly in end-stage kidney disease. You would have thought that actually these patients are seen three times a week, uh, every week by uh, their doctors, and therefore they would be easy to screen and enroll. It is not so. It's really very complex, and it's a matter of culture and infrastructure, and hopefully this will uh, move on very fast now. Now, let's get uh, in the diabetes and the cardiac kidney, and actually, recently, everybody is talking about cardiorenal metabolism, as if it is a single uh, area. And, and indeed, the AGLT2 inhibitor and the non-steroidal MRA phenylalanine have cardiac and kidney benefits, right? So any lessons here about the cardiac kidney crosstalk and potential common pathophysiology in heart failure and CKD? Uh, any thoughts about cardiac kidney composite primary endpoints in future cardiac kidney trials, for example? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So th there's no question about the crosstalk. I mean, um, I know you has uh, have led the thinking about the, the cardiorenal continuum. I've been interested for a very long time in the cardiodiabetes, cardiometabolic overlap, and, and, and we've discussed many occasions uh, uh, how insulin-resistant patients with heart failure are, how they they almost universally have prediabetes or diabetes with actually the minority who've got a normal glucose. And, and, and then, of course, you can't separate diabetes from kidney disease and you can't separate heart failure from either diabetes or kidney disease. Of course, the overlap's there. But that does create interesting questions. And, and it's a fascinating one you brought up about endpoints. So. Uh, I did do one trial uh, at altitude, which you know about with Aliskrin, um, and that did have a primary cardiorenal composite endpoint. In the TREAT study, we had a secondary cardiorenal composite endpoint, but there are some difficulties, I think, and I believe maybe that's what you're getting at, and I believe we need to think about how to overcome these. And of course, it's about the the timing of events in, in these populations and, and how you define the population. So if you have a population with moderately severe kidney disease, then actually it takes a long time to accumulate enough end-stage kidney disease events to be able to see whether or not there's an effective treatment to have the, the, the statistical power to do that. So of course, if you have a composite cardiorenal endpoint, and it's a time to first event endpoint, what will happen is that you will reach your target number of events for the composite outcome, uh, and, and that will be dominated by cardiovascular events, and you won't then have the power to look at whether or not there really was an effect on hard renal outcomes. So that's an issue a little bit depending on the population you use, depending on whether you are clever enough to, although you might have a composite cardiorenal outcome, maybe pre-specify that you still will not stop your follow-up until you've accrued a certain number of real events, or alternatively thinking about ways in which you can enrich your patient population such that they really have a very high risk of developing end-stage kidney disease, and therefore um, you can actually accrue uh, enough renal events alongside cardiovascular events to be able to look at the totality of these things together. You, you've obviously worked much more in this than I have, Fias, and thought about it much more than I have, and you may have figured out how to do this, but, but personally, I'm still struggling, struggling a little bit to know how to do it, but I think we should be doing it. My, my heart, my realm, my brain, but my heart tells me that we should be doing it because, of course, for a patient, whether you have heart failure, whether you're on dialysis, whether you die from a heart attack, or whether you die from a stroke, or whether you die from kidney disease, 
it doesn't really matter. Those are all really terribly bad things that you want to avoid. And sort of from a patient perspective, it makes a lot of sense to have an endpoint that encompasses all of those things that you don't want to get. But it's probably up to us to figure out a way to, to put that information together in a way that we can analyze it and interpret it and make sense of it. Fascinating. It, it, it looks like that at the meeting we will really have a great discussion. And uh, I'd like to ask you actually what people should expect from this uh, meeting, whether it is going to be a high level trialist, uh, you know, jargon and uh, uh, methodology and statistical design interpretation, or whether lay cardiologists may learn from you. Uh, who are you expecting to attend the meeting and uh, how would you tease everybody to connect and get on board? Thanks, guys. Well, it's for everybody. I mean, in fact, uh, we put this together with some colleagues from uh, uh, University of Toronto, and we asked all our friends, like your good self buyers, if they would help, and you all kindly agreed to help. And then we managed to get some funding to basically create the platform and make this freely available to anybody who wants to attend. So that's the most important thing. We tried to get all the lead investigators from all the important recent trials in not just the areas we talked about, but also in acute coronary syndromes and, and atherosclerosis. So we've got people like Gabrielle Steg, Deepak Bhatt, uh, talking about um, lipid lowering therapies. We've got talks on anti-thrombotic, antiplatelet therapies. We've got a fantastic talk on culture scene. We've got Judith Hockman talking about the ischemia trial. So, so we tried to cover the whole spectrum. But guys, in addition to sort of giving the latest updates on, on all of the trials that have been very, very important in the past year or two, we've also got, I think, in each of the areas, a talk about, well, what does this all mean? And how are we going to implement it? And what should we be doing for our patients? How will it affect guidelines? And then we also have a talk in each section uh, about that's not the end of the story. There's more in the pipeline. We're going to hear more exciting news in the next few months, even, and, and certainly next couple of years. So we've tried to look at where we've got to, what does it mean, and what we might see going forward. And we've got those two fantastic introductory lectures on each day from the real masters of trials and, 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 and key figures in the history of modern cardiovascular medicine. And then, and then really an amazing program. It, it's a star studded lineup of uh, who's who of, of all the major clinical trials and disease areas. So, I mean, we, we were overwhelmed by the generosity of, of all the contributors who agreed to take part in this. So we're trying to make this available to everybody. It's a fantastic educational opportunity. And I think every one of us will learn from it. Fantastic. So again, as a reminder, this is called the Global Trialist Summit. And uh, can you remind everybody what is the dates and the times of the meeting? Yeah, it's Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th of February. And uh, on Friday, it starts at 1700 GMT, and on Saturday, uh, 1200 hours GMT. Lovely. I hope that everybody will be connected, and I really can't wait. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Faiz. Thank you very much for interviewing me.